for joining us during your lunch hour. Um, I'd like to just say that on behalf of the Metropolitan Business League, our board of directors and CEO, Floyd Miller, I'd like to welcome each of you to our virtual town hall series, Continued, um, created to ensure we continue our commitment to small women and minority-owned businesses, ensure our ability to pivot during unprecedented times. The continuation of this series, launched, um, which launched in April, will focus on the recovery period for businesses impacted by COVID-19. Um, before we get started, I want to invite you to learn more about the MBL to include programming opportunities, um, specifically our Remarkable Women's Luncheon, which takes place next week. We're so excited about um, our ability to pivot that offering for our women. Um, and we're going to kick it off with a virtual comedy happy hour next Thursday, May 14th at 12 p.m. We encourage you to support a local restaurant during this time, like the Urban Hang Suite or Brewer's Cafe or Big Herms, to name a few all MBL members, and bring your own lunch um, while enjoying our featured participating guests. Enjoy special events and promotions um, to include our current promotion, which we're offering individuals and small business owners. Right now, we have a special um, where we're extending free membership through June 30th. This allows individuals to take advantage of our membership offerings now at no cost because we realize, again, that these are unprecedented times that require unprecedented measures and sources of support. So, again, we encourage you to take advantage of this membership promotion by signing up online at the mbl.org. Um, and while there, you can learn additional ways in which you can support the MBL so that we can continue doing the important work of serving the small business community. So today is near and dear to my heart, um, and I promise that I wouldn't get so get so um, mushy about it all, but I'm extremely happy to welcome our panelists for today. Um, I have the honor of introducing to you our first speaker, Lanice Robinson, owner of Parlor Salon. Lanice is a 12-year veteran in the beauty industry where she has served as a mentor, educator, and expert on textured hair. Her thirst for education and excellence continues to fuel her success in the industry. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest, my dear friend, my sister, um, Lanice Robinson. <laughs> Thank you so much, Melody. That wasn't that wasn't too mushy. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so first, I want to thank the audience um, as well. You know, I know everybody is dealing with a lot. Some people are homeschooling. So whatever you took time away from to be here, I, I want to say thank you. I really appreciate it. There are some business owners. There are probably people that may be aspiring to be business owners. So wherever you are in your journey, I just I'm hopeful that whatever we share today is, is helpful for you. Um, so I wanted to start there. And then I just want to jump right into what I'm going to share. Um, I found myself having a lot of conversations recently with peers and fellow business owners. Um, once the pandemic hit and we went into quarantine, um, people just were kind of struggling, not able to apply for unemployment, not really sure how to apply for the SBA money that, that's been made available to us. And, um, you know, it, it, it's just been a struggle. Um, although I didn't have that struggle because I had kind of prepared and I have an A team, which, you know, you'll meet in a moment, but they helped me to kind of set things up ahead of time so that I could go through this pretty much stress-free. Um, and so that's what I want to share with other business owners. Um, I, I think if we don't take anything else away from this pandemic, we can say for sure now that we cannot sit and wait on the government to, to bail us out. Like we, that's just been my reality. And I'm sure it's been the reality of a lot of other business owners. Um, so I also want to say, this is not something that I, you know, I just innately knew it's taken me three businesses to get this right. And I'm still going through things. I'm still trying to get it right. Um, but three businesses later, uh, here I am. So <clears throat> I never understood. One of the things that was always kind of confusing to me was the differences between um, an LLC a sole proprietorship, a corporation. I didn't really understand that. I know as an early uh, entrepreneur, things were kind of explained to me, like you start an LLC and then nobody can come at you personally. They can't come at your personal assets. But I didn't understand what that meant in terms of how I was being taxed. And so it's important to, to really understand that. And to be honest, initially I didn't even care. 
I had a plush corporate job. I was doing hair on the side. My income from my salon was really just my play money. So I didn't care. Um, and then a few years later, I left my corporate job just doing a salon. I was in partnership um, with someone who was in business for over 20 years. So it, it's no diss to her, but like, again, we didn't really understand how businesses are supposed to be set up. So I kind of trusted her with that uh, portion of the business, understanding how to set it up. So I, I also wasn't making any money. And, you know, if you're a business owner, you know, when you're starting a brand, you're in grind mode. You're not really focused on, okay, well, what do my taxes look like? How am I, and then you can't afford to pay for help. So you're doing a lot of things on your own. Um, so I think it took me about three years of that. And then I started to, I eventually had a good clientele, started to work with Deshaun um, on my finances. And I started to save more aggressively. Now, my, my relationship with financial, um, anything financial related, was um, growing up, my grandfather was very frugal. He saved a lot. My mom saved a lot. So I always kind of had that in the back of my mind, but I, I lost it as I got older. I just became irresponsible because I had this plush corporate job. <laughs> so I didn't really do what I learned. I just kind of was out there winging it. And uh, working with Deshaun, he, he likes to say that he does what I tell him to do, but I really just, I lean on him. Um, I do. Deshaun will tell you, I am one of those people who I can sit in the office with you. I can hear what you're saying. I can understand it. And I can make a decision in that moment. When I leave out of the office, it's gone. <laughs> I leave it there because once I walk away as a business owner, I got 25 things that I'm thinking about. 25 things that I got to figure out in a day's time. So um, I started working more aggressively with him. And um, I have my notes here, y'all, so forgive me. And uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't making as much money as I thought I should be or as I wanted to, but I was still paying a lot in taxes. So I was just kind of like, what, what am I doing? <laughs> Why am I still paying so much in taxes? And if you're a business owner, you know, before you own a business, tax day is like Christmas. When you become a business owner, you know, and Jerome will tell you, I go to his office and I'm just like, just tell me, just tell me what it is. <laughs> just tell me what it is. I always call it doomsday every year. So um, fast forward to 2016 and I'm, a, I'm about to start my new business. And I went to uh, a friend of mine, Star David. She owns Healthy Hair Republic. Um, shout out to her. She's in here watching too. But she wanted me to accompany her to a meeting uh, with some other accountants. So I went along and they explained what an escort was, among other things. It was just part of the conversation. Again, I'm sitting there and I understand it. I can comprehend it just fine. And so we were like, sign me up. But when I left, I didn't get it. So didn't get it until I met with Jerome for Doomsday the next, the next year. <laughs> and um, I also put myself on payroll at that time. I hadn't been paying myself. So I put myself on payroll and uh, my taxes were cut in half. What I owed was slashed in half. And that's a big deal as a business owner. It's a, it's a big deal. And so it took that, that um, to teach me that, uh, or to help me to understand what changes I made. Because I did it, but I still didn't understand why I was doing it. Didn't understand until, I, until the money hit. Once the money hit, then it made sense to me. And so those are the conversations that I've been having with my, with my peers change to an escort and i'm i'm gonna try to explain this in layman's terms i'm gonna really let the professionals uh explain it so it was my understanding that as an llc or a sole proprietorship the irs kind of looks at that as the same your income is is your money it's your personal income and so that's how you're taxed you're taxed on it as your personal income tax but you're self-employed so you're also being taxed with the self-employment tax. The self-employment tax is almost double what the personal income tax is. So you're being taxed twice on the same money. Um, and so once I switched to an S-Corp, I understood that I'm only taxed on the profit from my business and then my own payroll. So it slashed everything I was paying in half. And, um, and now that I can explain that to other business owners, they don't, they don't get it because the same way I didn't get it. They didn't get it, so they're like, uh, you know, maybe I'll change. I'll think about it. I'll look into it. 
not doing it. But I'm, I just want to be able to help people to understand the importance of that. Because when we hit a moment like we are in now, where you can't apply for unemployment because you don't have records showing where you've been paying yourself, or you realize that Virginia does not offer um, self-employed folks unemployment, you know, they had to make that change recently. So when you start to realize those things affect you, you can't apply for the SBA money because you don't have documentation. So when, when those things start to affect you and we're in a moment like we are now, I thought it was important to be able to share this uh, with other business owners. Um, but that's really it. That's my story. Hopefully I can, I can help somebody with that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's been a great, it's been really stress-free. I've been sitting home working, taking classes, going for walks. And uh, the governor is, you know, flip-flopping on dates. The, the country is. But I set a date for myself, and I'm comfortable with that. Uh, because Desha Deshaun helped to set me up, and Jerome helped to set me up. Thank you so much, Lenise. That was great. Um, and you just mentioned Jerome. So I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Jerome Clark. Jerome has a broad range of experience in the financial sector. He's held the positions of Director of Accounting for a Fortune 15 company, Chief Financial Officer for a regional financial planning firm in the Northeast, as well as the position of Senior Audit Manager with a Big Four accounting firm. As the former Chief Financial Officer for a regional financial planning firm in the Northeast, Jerome was responsible for all aspects of financial reporting and analysis, as well as providing the sales team with concepts to better serve their clients. Jerome, please go ahead whenever you're ready. All right, good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? It's not a good deal, good deal. Well, uh, I think Lenise did an outstanding job and she could probably take over my portion of the presentation, but I'll uh, go forward with it, with it anyway. Um, you know, and when I saw the topic restructuring your business like a pro, it just lit something up in me on the inside because I deal with this uh, pretty regularly um, in my profession. You know, as you mentioned, I worked in the accounting services industry for over 30 years now. And as such, I've seen and come across a number of instances with business professionals, you know, are looking to restructure their business. And in all cases, the primary objective in restructuring their business is to increase profitability, right? That's why all business owners are in business to, to make a profit. And so they wanna want to increase that to the highest level possible. Now, however, to increase business profitability, the business owner must fully understand the components of their business financial results. And the only true way to do that is by maintaining accurate uh, financial statements. And so we'll go through that here um, real briefly in an overview. So there are various areas that business owners would look to assess. So some of the areas would include uh, one, their revenue and sales. Uh, during a particular period, you know, what revenue did the business actually earn? And then when you look at the revenue that was earned of that revenue, what was actually collected? You know, it's one thing to earn revenue, but it's another thing to actually collect the revenue that you earned. And so that can have a significant impact on a business's cash flow. And so that's something that, that a business uh, owner will want to monitor and assess. Uh, another area that a business uh, we want to take a close look at are their expenses and, and be able to identify what are the biggest drains on their business cash. And, and there are a couple of examples that you can look at. Um, one is payroll. You know, payroll can be one of the most significant expenses, you know, of a business. And, and when, I, when I mention payroll, you're looking at both uh, actual or formal employees of the business or the business may be utilizing uh, independent contractors or subcontractors. Uh, also, you want to look at rent. You know, rent for a lot of businesses can be the, the greatest fixed expense that a business has. And what I mean by fixed expense is that whether you generate revenue or not, that bill is coming the first of every month. And so understanding, you know, that drain on your cash flow. And then debt service. You know, sometimes when you look at financial statements, uh, some businesses tend to forget about the debt service. But if a business has taken out loans or, you know, lines of credit to, to help with working capital, there's a monthly, you know, payment or debt service that's going to be required. So those are some of the things that, that a business want, uh, will like to monitor as well as they look at restructuring. Um, and then at the end of the day, 
you know, taxes. Lenise uh, mentioned a couple of times on taxes. And one of the things that I found is, you know, when you're talking to individuals, you know, whether they're business owners or not, when you mention taxes by default, people think income taxes. And at the end of the day, that, you know, that's, that's a valid thought because that's the bottom line. You want to assess, you know, what your net bottom line is and ultimately what your projected, you know, tax liability uh, could be. And you want to do everything that you can to lower that tax liability. And, uh, and you said outstanding job, you know, kind of giving an overview on the differences between being taxed as a sole proprietor uh, versus being taxed um, under the S corporation structure. And so you want to you want to look at that as well. But there are other components of, of taxes that, you know, many business owners are faced with. Another one would be payroll taxes, okay? And payroll taxes can cause a major cash crunch, you know, because there's one thing that, that you know, I find that uh, is sometimes overlooked. But if you, if you, if you take it from, from this standpoint, every $100 that you pay in actual payroll really costs the business about $110. You know, so there's about an additional 10% that's added on top of, you know, the base uh, cash that's, that's, you know, dispersed in payroll. And what tends to trip folks up sometimes is that on payday, you don't need to have that full amount because you're only paying the net uh, amount that's due to your employees. But that payroll tax is kind of looming in the background. And I've seen it cause some challenge uh, for many businesses over the years. But, you know, we want to make sure that we monitor that. And then depending on the type of business that you have, if you're uh, actually selling products, um, you're gonna have to deal with sales taxes. And so, and as a sales tax um, item, you're just you know, monitoring or managing the pass-through. You're collecting sales taxes from, from your customers and then you're paying it along to the state, but that may be an opportunity to restructure you know, your billing and how you actually bill where you, know, you can avoid that whole uh, sales tax process. So that's something you wanna look at as well. And then the last area I will look at related to taxes is really your personal property taxes. And basically that's the tax that you pay on equipment that you use to operate your business, whether it's furniture, you know, computer equipment, audio visual equipment, anything that you use to, to operate your business, you know, the county, the state and so forth, you know, they want a, 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 you to pay a fee basically for utilizing that equipment. So when, again, you're looking to restructure your business, these are some of the things um, that you want to take into consideration and taxes have a couple of components related to that as well. So as we move forward, when you think about the restructuring process, uh, there are a couple of things that, that you want to uh, be mindful of. One uh, is to take a look and review your comparative financial statements. And you want to look at that over a period of time. And now, when you think about your financial statements, you know, there are two primary, uh, well, three, I'll say, but the primary financial statements that, you know, most individuals are familiar with is one, your uh, income statement or your P&L, right, which covers your activity over a period of time. And you want to look at that on a month-to-month -month basis. You want to look at that a uh, year over year basis. And so you'll be able to determine uh, the variances that are taking place in your business. Um, you know, is your business, you know, revenue going up or are your expenses going down just based on the financial statements. And you also wanna look at, you know, your actual results versus what you were anticipating or planning to happen. In other words, your budget. Now, what I found is that there are many business uh, owners that, that don't go through the process of putting together you know, a budget because they say it's really just a guess. And it is a guess, but there is some science that can be put behind that. But having a budget in place can give you some very valuable information to let you know if your business is operating at the level that you were expecting it to and being able to, to identify um, any variances that, that come into play. And it'll help you to quickly identify areas that may be causing some issues for the business. Now, one problem areas, once the problem areas are identified, then you can quickly, you know, take some steps and actions to, to rectify those issues. All right. And so understanding, you know, your primary financial statements, like I mentioned, you know, your income statement, or many folks, you know, know it as the PL or profit and loss statement. Again, it's going to cover your activity over a period of time, whether you're looking at 
you know, 30 days for the month, you know, the last three months for the quarter or, or over the year, which is utilized to um, prepare your tax return. So you want to uh, be mindful of that. Uh, but then you also want to to make sure you understand your balance sheet. And a lot of business owners don't spend a whole lot of time on the balance sheet because really your P&L is the primary uh, statement that's used for your tax return. But your balance sheet is important because it lets you know at any point in time what your business is actually worth. So you look at your total assets, you know, everything that the business owns versus your liabilities, you know, everything that the business owes. And the difference is going to be the net worth of the business, you know, today or as of year end at any, any point in time. And then the last statement I'll, I'll mention is your cash flow statement. You know, you want to analyze where your cash is being provided um, and where your cash is being used, right? And cash can come into the business from a variety of ways. Hopefully the vast majority is coming in through sales, you know, the sale of your product or service. But cash can come into the business through through investments, from the business owner making capital contributions to the business, from loans. Uh, and you want to make sure they're categorized properly because all of those are in taxable events. You're only going to pay taxes on the cash that's generated through the sale of your product and service. So you want to understand that. And then you also want to make sure you understand what your cash is being used by. You know, expenses, what are you, what are you paying on? Uh, debt service, and also owner drawers, right? All of us get into business so that the business can actually uh, generate income for us personally. And so you want to make sure you monitor that as well. So as I wrap up, just want to make sure that all of our business owners on the line, they remember that accounting is the basis for all business decisions. And so as long as you're in business, you're going to make sure that you understand your accounting because that's going to help you to know if your business is heading in the right direction and if there are needs to restructure, you can handle that accordingly. Um, and with that, I'll uh, pass it back over. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jerome. That was really good, really appreciate that. You dropped a lot of gems in 10 minutes. That was great, really, really, really great. Okay, so now we will hear from Deshaun Chapman. Deshaun is uh, a district director and financial advisor with Northwestern Mutual in Richmond, Virginia. As a leader at the Richmond firm, Deshaun is responsible for attracting, developing, and retaining successful financial representatives. He is also focused um, in, on his thriving personal practice. Deshaun is a registered investment advisor. He works with clients to identify their financial security needs and then focuses on solutions that can help make these financial goals a reality. He helps find the right solutions for personal, family, or business needs. He is passionate about educating his clients about financial security. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll hear from Deshaun Chapman. All right, thanks for that. And great job, Jerome. Yes, um, thanks for having me today. And thanks for Lenise uh, for her kind words and her testimony. Um, very passionate uh, about working with individuals in general, uh, especially business owners. Uh, business owners are special in the sense that uh, we think differently. And by the way, I'm a business owner. I'm not an employee of Northwestern Mutual. I'm in business for myself after leaving engineering after 15 years. And so I like uh, how business owners think, and I love to surround myself with other great business owners. So this is a great opportunity for me as well. Um, just to, if you think about the anatomy of a business owner, uh, someone who wants to uh, go at it alone or depend on their own skills, their own assets versus working for a corporate uh, corporation. You know, they feel that they're passionate about something and they want to work on their craft. And so with that in mind, you know, my, the challenge with business owners is you know what you know, right? And you don't know what you don't know, right? So that's why it's important to use Lenise's analogy is to have an A-team. You know, have a Jerome, have a Deshaun, or have somebody else that's the expertise in that area so that you can focus on what you're good at, right? And what you're gifted for. And so those are the things that uh, I want to talk to you about is how to make your business bulletproof, financially bulletproof, right? So one thing that uh, COVID has taught us is that we have to unexpect it, the unexpected. We have to expect the unexpected, right? No one saw this coming. No one. 
right? If they did, they're, they're lying. <laughs> but what's the next thing around the corner, right? It might not be COVID, but it might be something else. But we know, you know, if you, if you live for a, for a while, there is something around the corner, and not necessarily to be fearful about, but to have a good plan in place, right? To make sure that you plan to be successful as a business owner. And so there are some special considerations that you should have as a business owner. So I wanted to share that with you. And, and uh, it's been a pleasure working with uh, Lanise in the sense that she knows what she's good at and the things that she's not versed in, then she knows enough to reach out and ask for some support and expertise. And so every time we get together, I just tell her, hey, we need to say more. And she gives me that look. And I say, yep, we need to say more. And uh, fortunately, she's been very responsive to that and, uh, you know, benefited from it. So what I like to do in my five minutes is take a 60,000 foot view and put some things on uh, a slide and just walk you through it and to get you start thinking about it. Right. So that. Right. So whether you feel like you're ill prepared for what's going on now or you feel like you're very prepared. Right. Doesn't matter. Right. We want to make sure that we learn from this event and just get better get better as business owners. And that's what it's about, right? Not beat ourselves up, but use this as a tuition, as a learning process and, and be better and be ready for the next event that's uh, probably, probably gonna happen. So let me just share uh, something that I've prepared here. And hopefully everyone can see my screen. If I can get a couple of nods to make sure, let me see here. Yep, all right, good. All right, so as a business owner, what keeps you up at night? You know, we like to ask a lot of questions and maybe you're saying nothing keeps me up at night. I sleep very well, right? But you know what I mean, right? There's always some things that's in the back of our mind. What if this, what if that, right? So we wanna ask those questions now before it happens so that we can put the things in place. So some questions you may have depend upon the various states you are. And as a business owner, can I retire in 10 years? Can I retire in five years? Can this business fund my retirement, right? If you have a partner, what if my partner die? What if they become sick? What if they become injured? What does that mean? Do I want to pass this business down to my family or to a key employee? Um, you know, if, if I have debt in the business, if something happens to me, what happens to that debt? So there's different questions that business owners have. How do you expand the business? If you need credit, right, how do I get credit? Right, one of the most interesting things as of late has been, right, so when folks wouldn't apply for this PPP loan, they go to their bank and the bank says, sorry, I can't help you, All right? So having a, a great relationship with a banker, right? How do I establish that relationship with a banker? How do I establish a line of credit? So there's, there's a lot of questions and sometimes there's few answers. And so that's where your A team come into play, whether it's somebody like Jerome, a financial advisor, attorney, or a banker, they can help you answer those questions so that you can focus on what you're good at, okay? So what's keeping you up at night? If you were to think about it, what's some things that keep you up at night? Maybe if they don't keep you up at night, what do you think about? What concerns you? What makes you afraid? So what I like to talk about is um, how to identify and prioritize goals, right? So have, having a plan, right? So you gotta have a plan. It's all about proper planning and executing that plan. What are some of the critical asset classes of your business? How to protect your businesses and how to make your businesses bu bulletproof? What are the different stages of business development? And so, and the role, lastly, the role of your A-team. So here are some things to think about, right, for your business. Um, how do you cover your liability for any business loans or leases that you personally guarantee? How do you ensure your business expenses are paid if you become disabled? Right, this is your baby. Uh, you're the driving force behind this business. And I know you, you're 10 foot tall, bulletproof, superwoman, superman, but if you can't do what you do, where does the money come from? These are questions that have to be asked and have to be answered. How do you protect your business? How do you do valuation? So how's your, 
how, what's the value of business? What is it worth? If you were to sell it, how do you determine that? And then if you have employees, right, that's a whole nother level of, of complexity. How do you recruit, retain, and reward em employees? Especially in an environment where uh, prior to this pandemic, where the economy was, was doing sort of well, and people, unemployment was low, and people could move different places. How do you retain those key employees, right? There's some employees you, wanna, <laughs> you want them to leave, but there's others that you want to retain. How do you do that? And what are some benefits that you provide, and what's some executive benefits? So these are the four asset classes of your business, right? It, it might be you have a building or not. Uh, equipment, maybe you lease your car, maybe you, you lease trucks, right? These are the physical assets of your business. And then one of the most important pieces of your business, if you have employees, as you know, are employees, human capital. And retaining those employees is, is of, of critical success to your business. And then the business itself. So how does it show up in the marketplace? How do you market it? How do you attract more clients? How do you maintain goodwill, your reputation? How do you build and strengthen those relationships with your client? How do you appreciate them? And then you as a business owner, right? You're the one that's holding all this together. You're the key person as well as the owner. So there's four different areas of your business and here's where your A team comes to, comes to play. Right, every successful business have a couple of key people that's uh, on their team. The A team, your accountant, interesting enough, starts with the A, right? Somebody like a Jerome, your attorney, uh, your banker, having that personal relationship, pre uh, professional relationship with your banker, and then obviously your financial professional. And they're going to help you with business planning, they're going to help you with personal financial planning. And then when you're ready to retire, they're going to help you with exit planning. So on the business planning side, um, you can be exposed, right? So there are some liabilities there. So if somebody get hurt, employee gets hurt in your shop or get hurt at your place of business. What does that mean for you? And what are your exposure there? And then also protection from loss of owners and, and uh, key employees. So you gotta think about some risk management strategies, right? So how do you manage risks associated with your physical assets, uh, any copyrights or formulas that you may have, and then your people assets, how do you protect them as well? So some key questions there is, is your liability insurance up to date? Is it enough? Does it cover everything you need to cover? Uh, is your intellectual property protected? How you protect your ability to generate income? If you can't do what you do, where does the money come from? How will business expenses be paid, right? As a business owner, if I can't do what I do, I still get employees. Guess what? They still want to get paid. <laughs> Their family still rely on them. So we've got to make sure we got some key strategy there. And then key employee, right? That person that you really rely on, they're your right-hand person, right? How do you make sure that they're protected and you're protected? And so there's conversations about benefits. Well, I can't really afford it. Well, do you really know that? Unless you sat down with a professional to help you think through, through that. In a I'm very sorry, competitive Deshaun, world. This is your one minute warning. Okay, thank you. Uh, in welcome. competitive situations, you, you must have some strategies in place to re re retain uh, key employees. At some point in time, we all want to retire and the business our baby that we generated we want to pass it off in good hands so there are some strategy business valuation strategies there there's some buy sell strategies if you have uh, a partner and there's some questions that you have to ask yourself who would be your successor what's the value of the business and who will pay for it lastly and most importantly is uh most business owners they're serial entrepreneurs they're always putting it to their business they're waiting for a perfect day to save there's never a perfect day i'm 48 years old haven't had a perfect day yet Still waiting on that. So yesterday was the best day to say. So make sure you got some risk management in place. You're accumulating wealth outside your business, diversifying your assets, and you're pre preserving those wealth as well. And there's different stages of the business. There's a checklist that you should follow. But the bottom line is get your A team and make sure that they're watching your blind spots. That's gonna allow you to focus on the things that's critically important to you and that you're really good at. 
Thank you so much, Deshaun. We really appreciate that. And thanks again to all of our panelists. And now we're going to open it up to Q&A. There was a lot there that I actually have questions about. Um, so again, we're going to use this as a time to and an opportunity to ask the experts. Um, they're going to help you in your business or, or in your organization. So if you have a question for a particular person, please include that within your question. Like this question is for Deshaun, um, and that'll help a lot be a, a lot for uh, routing um, to who should to who should be responding. So again, you can either type it in the chat if you haven't already, or you can raise your hand. We all practiced that earlier and we'll call on you so that you can ask your question. Uh, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Jasmine who can lead us in Q&A. Jasmine, take it away. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so as Andrea mentioned, we are gonna transition now into Q&A. So if you do have any questions, drop them in the chat or raise your hand and Catherine will be able to assist me with unmuting you um, so that you can ask the, ex ask the experts. So our first question, one, I do wanna say thank you so much to all of our speakers. Uh, I don't know if you were reading the chat as we, um, during the time, but a lot of people said, thank you so much, great information. I do wanna first go into our first question, which is from Derica Alexander. She reads, um, and this is to Jerome, actually, do you recommend using an attorney to set up a S-Corp? Um, that's a great question. And I would say certainly, particularly if there's going to be more than one owner, uh, because you want that attorney to uh, formulate through input of the owners, the operating agreement, who's going to be responsible for what, um, how the ownership interests of the business is segmented and so forth. So I would certainly say uh, consult an attorney for that process. Thank you, Jerome. Really appreciate that. Um, if you have any more questions, just make sure to drop them in the chat, you all. Um, I will turn it over to Andrea. I know she had a couple questions, so we can hear from some of your questions, Andrea. Oh, absolutely. And for um, everyone in the chat, um, I again, I know I don't want to go over um, someone else's questions, but there's, did we just do Randy Brown? Is that who we have? Oh, they are and coming then, in now. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I, I have mine, but I want to make sure that our guests go first, because I know how to reach Deshaun <laughs> and Jerome right now if I had to. <laughs> so the questions are rolling. So I'm going to, I'm going to let you go ahead, Jazzy. Thank you, Andrea. Um, this question also from um, Randy Brown. Thank you for joining us, Randy. It's from Jerome, for Jerome. He asks, please speak to the importance of meeting with your accountant on a regular basis. <laughs> Underline, highlight, regular basis <laughs> versus waiting until tax time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll certainly address that. Uh, despite what Lanise and Melody will tell you, I do actually enjoy meeting with them. Um, but the, the, the thing about meeting with your accountant throughout the year is that by the time you get to the end of the year, January or February, mm -hmm. you're just recording history. You don't have a whole lot of opportunities to do anything that's going to impact your tax liability. However, if you're meeting with your, your tax professional or just general accountant uh, quarterly, I would recommend, or at least you know several times during the year, and if you're projecting that you're going to have uh, potential tax liability, this gives you an opportunity to consult with financial professionals like Deshaun and others, because now you have some runway to address that liability before you get to the end of the year. So I certainly uh, recommend that you meet with your accountant throughout the year. I will piggyback off of that. Yes. And just a friendly reminder, if you haven't already, already, make sure to file your taxes. I know a couple people that are, you know, still waiting. So just want to put that out there. Another question from Cindy. Thank you for joining us, Cindy. She asks, can, oh, of course. So <laughs> I do want to let you all know um, that we will be having the presentations available to our attendees and a post email that goes out to our attendees. So you will be getting that. And then also we are recording this session. Um, so we will make that recording avail available to you within the next couple of days by the end of the uh, Yeah, within the next couple of days, you will have access to this recording as well. Our next one. <sighs> Going through, filtering through all the questions. 
what is the what is the difference between an S corp and a C corp? So this question is not for in, in a, any particular panelist. So anyone can ask, answer the question. But what is the difference between an S corp and a C corp? Great question, Cindy. I'll, I'll jump in. So the the primary difference is a C corp is is like another individual, another person. It pays its own taxes and it files a tax return, and there's a tax liability, an income tax liability generated by the C Corp, or what's also referred to as a standard corp. An S Corp is a version of a pass-through, which means that that entity does not pay income taxes in and of itself. The net profit or loss is passed through to the owners, and so that's the primary difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jerome. I don't know if you want to pay back off of that, Deshaun. <laughs> I saw you leading in a little bit. <laughs> You're good. All righty. Um, if you have any more questions, make sure to drop in the chat. I know we have one comment, and I think everyone can attest to this, Melody. She says that oh, she loves to see Jerome, but runs out whenever she gets to the meeting. <laughs> I completely, probably everyone on the call, majority of everyone can attest to that. Um, another question comes in from Valerie. Thank you for joining us, Valerie. She asks, how does your membership work? Did you say you are offering complimentary benefits? If so, will the benefits be the same? I think this is a question for yourself, Melody, if I'm not mistaken. Valerie, we can't unmute your mic if you do want to, or um, put it in the chat if you are referring to the MBM. Just waiting on a response from you, Val. I just thought that I had heard something about the membership and I wanted to find out like, you know, did I hear it correctly? And if it is a membership opportunity right now and it is complimentary, are the benefits the same as a paying member? Mm, great question. Yes, so thank you for your interest, Valerie. Absolutely, so we are running a membership promotion as you see on your screen where you're able to enjoy all the benefits of the MBL um, membership between now and June 30th. Um, and so the different levels of membership, you can find the details of the levels of membership at the mbl.org. But to answer your question, absolutely, you can um, enjoy all the full benefits of membership now. And we'd love to have you. Thank you, Melody. That was a great question, a great segue, I will say myself. Any other questions, make sure to drop your question in the chat. I do have one for um, Lindsay. So, um, I mean, Lindsay, I'm so sorry. I know we are, everyone on um, that has been a speaker today has been mentioning the A-team. And you, of course, has been, have been like the focal point of your A-team, which is Deshaun and Jerome. How did you go about creating your A-team? What, what did you find was essential in creating your A-team that comprised of what I would say is, uh, has been very influential during this time? Um, networking. Um, so Jerome and I, Jerome and I actually used to go to church together, but interestingly enough, I, my last corporate job, he left before I got there. And so we knew some of the same people, you know, that way as well. So, uh, and I always knew he was a great guy. So, you know, why not use the people I know? Um, and then Deshaun, Deshaun actually found me. Um, I used to work with another advisor and, um, you know, I'm going to just be transparent. I liked him, so I did whatever he told me to do. Mm -hmm. You know, women, we can get stupid sometimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there was a transition there that happened for him, I think, and then, you know, whatever. And then a few years later, Deshaun reached out um, just and just picked up my information. And the first time I met with Deshaun, I just remember him mentioning his daughters, and um, he kind of, he talks to me like he would talk to his daughter. <laughs> and um, you know, and I appreciate that. Like I need because I don't because I leave things with him. I need to know that I can trust him. Mm -hmm. And so if I, if I don't feel that connection, then it's it's a wash. So that's how I put my team together. But it's really about networking for me. Um, I'm rather introverted, so I don't do well with like meeting new people and new mm -hmm. relationships. So if there's no like link or connection there, then I don't always do well with that. So that that was it was helpful for me to already know Jerome before I work with him. I understand that there's a lot of trust that has to go into someone helping manage your money. <laughs> so managing your money and finances, a lot of trust has to go into those hands. Now, Deshaun, how is it, or say, what do you think, why is it so important to have that good relationship with your clients? I know that sometimes, like Lindsay, uh, Lindsay said, 
when someone just tells you to do something, then you just do it. But you don't, I feel like the foundation of having that trust between you and your client is great to um, better help manage your finances. So if you can speak on that, what do you think about that concept? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, uh, trust is key. As somebody already alluded to, it comes down to trust, um, especially when, you, when you're dealing with people's money, right? Dealing with money, uh, talking about money is taboo in some communities, mm -hmm. right? In other communities, you talk about it, right? You, you get to know money very well and how money flows. So, but uh, for people, you know, a lot of people, uh, I call them first generation savers. A lot of us first time, uh, we're the first to go to college and have good jobs and things like that and talk to financial advisors. So have somebody that you can really trust and connect with and believe that have your best interest in mind is very important. And then as a financial advisor, um, having that relationship with persons so you can move them to action, right? So you can know exactly what to say, what to do to push that button. Because what you find often is that uh, there are some folks that grew up in households that didn't talk about money. So, you know, those behaviors um, show up as we get you know, older as adults and we don't do a good job of saving. We, we spend more money than we make. Mm -hmm. And then also you might have somebody who's in their childhood. They had a family who talked about money investing and then they get older and life got in the way. So needless to say, they're not good stewards of the money. So if you don't have that relationship with that person, you challenge them on a, on a level to get back to um, their best version of themselves, then that can be off-putting, right? So, uh, but when you have that relationship, you can say, hey, now you know you can do better, right? Or I'm looking at your, I'm looking at your budget here and there's too much down and out, right? So really kind of poking them a little bit, but you, Lenise is laugh, laughing. <laughs> But with trust and relationship, then at the end of the day, that person knows that you have their best interest in mind and uh, you're just trying to help them uh, get to uh, their, their stated goals. And, and if I can add to that, so like I had a, an aha moment with Jerome. So with Deshaun, um, I had started saving with, with him and, and more aggressively than I had been in the past. Mm -hmm. And so my aha moment with him was a couple of years ago, I needed to buy my son his first car. And, um, and I was like, man, what am I, what am I going to do? And again, I leave it with him. I get everything he's saying when he's explaining it to me and I make, I help make decisions for myself. But when I walk out, I forget about it. And so I, I forgot that I had even been saving this money until the last minute. And I was like, let me call Deshaun. <laughs> so, um, and I think a little while after that is when I, I started to increase my savings even more. Mm -hmm. So that, that was my aha moment for me. And, and again, it's about not waiting until, you know, the pandemic hits the fan, but being prepared ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree to that. And I love, Deshaun, your, the title of your presentation was Making Your Business Financial, fin financial Bulletproof. If I'm financially bulletproof. Yes. Financially bulletproof. I love that title because I definitely be, think that speaks to what you said, Lenise, is you don't want to wait till the last minute till something happens for you to scramble and think of, ooh, where am I going to get all this money from? So starting very early helps you for things like this. God forbid they do happen again. But if they do, you're, you're financially prepared to make that um, commitment, whatever it may be. So I, one, thank you so much, panelists. I do want to pass it over. If One, if you do have any more questions for our speakers, make sure to drop in the chat, raise your hand. They are here. They are experts to help you. Um, so definitely don't let this opportunity pass you by because they are dropping jewels, dropping gems, like we've been saying in the chat. <laughs> so we had a couple of minutes in case any more um any more questions do come in. And I had one question, so I'll get, I'll squeeze my question in. It is about an S Corp and a C Corp. And mm -hmm. I know we can't get into all the weeds and the details and all of that, but I did want to talk to you a, li a little bit about, I know there've been some changes recently too um, that um, affect S Corps, C Corps and the like. And if those if it's beneficial still to be an S Corp. And I am certain, let me do all your disclaimers, Jerome. It's a case by case situation. It depends on uh, how you were structured originally and what other things you got going on. And there, I, I get all of that, you know, 
well, how, how were you filing before? How do you accept money? Are you accrual? Are, I mean, like, I'm sure there's a like disclaimer, 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 disclaimer. All right. So pretend we've said them all is <laughs> what is the, what is the deal now with it being an S corp and why maybe the focus has maybe shifted or why some feel the focus has shifted to it not being the same as it once was. Disclaimer, 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 disclaimer. disclaimer. So, uh, so the, the, the standard typical answer you'll get from an accountant is it depends, right? Right. It, at the end of the day, it depends. And, and, and I appreciate you saving me, you know, 30 minutes of disclaimers there. So, um, but at the end of the day, my, my personal opinion is that the S corporation still has a lot of valuable benefits and, you know, Folks are referring to, you know, the, the new tax law that went into effect for 2018. And it, it added this new component, you know, called this, this qualified business income deduction. And, that, and some individuals, you know, depending on how they filed previously, um, if they were filing as, you know, a sole proprietor or as, you know, Lenise made reference to a single member LLC, mm -hmm. you know, there are some, some, some nuances there that an S Corp may not necessarily provide them any additional benefit, you know, based on a new tax law. However, at the end of the day, when you, when you look at the, the structure that an S Corp provides for you, it can literally save you, you know, as, as Lanice, you know, alluded to, it cut her tax liability in half. And so that S Corp structure can literally save you a significant amount of money in, in uh, tax dollars spent um, at the end of the day. So I, I think it's still a value structure. Okay. That was really well done as an answer, by the way, too, without <laughs> saying it depends. Lots of things. It depends. And I know, and I think we all know that to be, to be true as well. And I didn't know if there's any other questions before I, nope, good. So I'll do my next question. Um, the, and I think this might be an easy one. Um, one of the things we talked about, um, it was kind of glossed over and I'll just, say it from my perspective which is Lanice mentioned it about having your 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 a team together but one of the things uh, that i've experienced in this uh this pandemic and as we start to recover uh the programs that were available were available to people who had their house in order and so i know that it's a lot of nodding right so i think if you didn't have your house in order before and then it's hard to get it together yeah. in um, that amount of time. And so I think I loved what Lenny said about, you know, she's not waiting on the government because that doesn't mean all is lost if there is anybody that happens to be in our meeting that maybe it just, the, the PPP and these other programs didn't work out for you because other paperwork wasn't together. So I loved what you said, Lenise, about you can't count on the government anyway to, you know, keep you moving and keep you going. But I don't know if Deshaun or Jerome, maybe you want to highlight some of those things that maybe um, if we could if we could do some fixes right away, what would some of those fixes be uh, right? Like what would be the top two things you would do today other than call you? So call you is number one. <laughs> call Deshaun, call Jerome, call Lenise for feedback and support, right? <laughs> Lenise, tell us about it. It's awful. And she can commiserate with you and go, it is awful to pay. It's awful. Um, so that's number one. But number two and three, what would you say, Deshaun? And then what would you say, Jerome? Like, what could I do today? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, first thing is uh, you, you understand that you can't look backwards, right? Mm -hmm. um, just move forward and, and learn from it. I, I call a lot of things that happen tuition. You pay tuition, let's move forward. And, you know, that increases your knowledge. So I, I would say save, right? Because, again, you can rely on your savings, your money, or you can rely on somebody else's money. And it's interesting, right? So when we do financial planning, we tell individuals to have about six months of savings for any day fund. We call it e-fund. We tell businesses to have six months to 12 months of savings, well, evidently, the big businesses are, are not even doing that, right? Because they need bailouts. The banks are not doing that. So you have these businesses that are making billions of dollars in profits, and they've done it over the past 10 years. And then, you know, one to two, two months of not having uh, customers, 
now, you know, they're looking at bankruptcy. They're looking at, uh, uh, you know, they, they're requesting bailouts. So let's not do what they do. Let's not do what the government do. Let's rely on ourselves, right? That's why we're business owners. Say, hey, I'm, 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 I'm going to go at it myself. So the biggest thing I would say is, is save, right? Save now. Don't wait later. Don't wait for a perfect day. Start saving 20% off the top and self-insure you become the bank. So if this happens again next year, you're not having to fill out PPP. If you do, then, then great. That's fine. But at the end of the day, you look at your balance sheet, like Jerome mentioned, and you look at your assets and you say, hey, I'm fine for six months. Good for me. Absolutely. I mean, I think they show you hit you hit the nail right on the head there. And you know, from an accounting standpoint, I would say to focus on, you know, segregating your, your personal affairs from your business affairs. You know, oftentimes, particularly with, with smaller businesses, you know, they what we refer to as co-mingle their funds. So, you know, they're operating, you know, their business out of their personal account and things, you know, get get mixed up and, and, and co-mingled. And so it's hard to determine, you know, if your business, you know, the health of your business and if your business is in a position to maintain for the next six months. And if your household, your personal household is in the, in the position to maintain, you know, for, you know, the six to 12 months um, that they Sean, you know, referred to. So I would say the first thing to do, if, if not already, to make sure that there's some separation that you have you know, specific business accounts that handle all of your business affairs and, you know, your personal accounts are again set, set aside. And, and I get it, you know, especially with, with newer businesses or, or smaller operations, oftentimes we're utilizing personal funds to, you know, to fund our business operations. But I would say go through the process. If you're going to do that, deposit your personal funds into your business account and then spend from there um, as opposed to just, you know, taking a shortcut and purchasing business items and disbursements directly from, from your personal accounts because that'll give you a clear line of sight on your business activities um, versus your personal activities. Can, can I just say something real quick too to, bo to both of those points? With Deshaun, um, for one, um, I wasn't even gonna apply for, for money from the government. Deshaun had to talk me. <laughs> I just didn't want to rely on it. You know, we've seen what's been happening. I didn't want to rely on it. And to Jerome's point, again, I want to, I just want to stress that it is never too late to start. It took me 10 years to even get to the point where I switched over to an S Corp and paid myself. I literally just this year, the beginning of this year, started to separate my money. And seeing that change from January and we're in, now in May, that has helped me just in that short amount of time. So it's never, it's never too late to make those changes. Again, I don't have it all together, but I have a team who supports me and I'm, I'm super mindful of what, what my finances are doing. So. That's excellent, Lenny. Thank you all so much. So the time now is one o'clock. And so I'm going to turn it over to Melody to wrap up our meeting, but thank you all so much for joining. Can, I'm sorry, this is Randy Brown. Can I jump in for one question? Sure, Randy. Okay, I just want to ask, because both Jerome and Deshaun, you're, pro you're financial professionals, but this is um, to the panel. So what other professions should we be looking to, towards to, um, to, to include in our A-team, you know, sort of structuring a management team? What are some of the other professions we should be looking at or some of the other areas we should be looking at? Yeah, so, so when I work with business owners, um, it is very common and consistent. They have obviously a CPA, right? Uh, they handle their taxes and everything is associated with that. They have an attorney, right? Especially if they have employees, right? So they understand contract, employee, et cetera. Um, they have a financial planner, right? Because yeah, they might be good in their business, doesn't necessarily mean they're good in their personal finances, right? Absolutely. So that's, that's important as well. Um, anything else I'm missing, Jerome? No, I think I think you you're right on point. And depending on you know the type of business, you know they may have uh, you know an insurance professional that handles the property and casualty side. If that's something you know that their financial uh, advisor doesn't handle in house, but um, but absolutely. But the, the last thing I would say as a banker, right? Uh, again, situations like this, um, if you had a great relationship with your banker, then they're able to expedite some of the uh, loans that was available. 
if you didn't have a relationship with the with the banker, then you found yourself trying to establish that, and it's, it's, it's kind of after the fact. So those are the four: a banker, CPA, financial advisor, and attorney. Uh, when I work with business owners, it's very common that they have those four uh, individuals on their A team. Absolutely. So critical. Thank you guys so much. And Melody, thank you so much um, for uh, closing us out. Much, Lanise, Jerome, and Deshaun for carving out time from your day away from your families and your teams um, just to share with us this valuable information. I know that I've taken a ton of notes, so I'm, I'm, I'm extremely grateful for your time. Um, to our attendees, thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. We're hopeful you are leaving the session more informed and encouraged. Thanks to the gems provided to us by our guest panelists today. We ask that you continue to support the NBL Town Hall Series by saving the date and attending next Wednesday, May 13th at 12 p.m. The series will be every Thursday this month with the exception of next week. Again, so save the date next Wednesday, May 13th at 12 p.m. Please um, share the information with your friends, your network, um, where the topic will be how to manage remote and office and hybrid teams during COVID-19. Our featured guest will be NBL member Robin Mack, the CEO of Mass Global. And in closing, we ask that you continue to follow us on our social media platforms, to include Facebook at the NBL and Instagram at NBLRVA for the latest information on resources, programming, and special events in support of small women and minority-owned businesses. Thank you all again for your time and make it a great day, everyone. <laughs>